Thank you very much, Liv. Um, good morning and good afternoon to journalists joining us online. While a few countries are still facing surges in many countries of the Western Pacific, the number of COVID-19 cases and the deaths has now decreased and plateaued. There are also more and more people getting vaccinated and pressure on hospitals and health systems in many places has eased. In most parts of the region, the things are trending in the right direction. But in addition to those currently dealing with surges, even in countries which have successfully suppressed the virus and those which have managed to recall zero cases today, including several Pacific countries, Pacific Island countries, we cannot be complacent. Globally, cases have been increasing for seven consecutive weeks and the number of deaths has started to rise too, driven largely by the Delta variants and decreased in the use of protecting measures in other parts of the world. And in the past week, we have designated a new variant of concern, Omicron. COVID-19 has now spread all over the world, and we should not be surprised to see more surges in the future. As long as transmission continues, the virus can continue to mutate as the emergence of Omicron demonstrates, reminding us of the need to stay vigilant. With the upcoming holiday season, we'll see more gatherings and movements of people, and the Northern Hemisphere winter may also bring surges of other respiratory diseases like influenza alongside COVID-19. It is clear that this pandemic is far from over. And I know that people are worried about the Omicron, I understand. But my message today is that we can adapt the way we manage this virus to better cope with the future surges and reduce their health, social, and economic impacts. Before I explain more on this, I'll hand over to our Director of Health Security and Emergency, Dr. Babatunde Olowakule, for a more detailed update on the COVID-19 situation globally and in this region. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Regional Director. And I will uh, divide my presentation into two parts. The first part will give you the regional uh, and uh, global overview, uh, as has been said, and, and then uh, talk to you a little bit uh, about um, the new uh, variants that has been identified uh, called Omicron. So on, on the next slide, you'll see the global situation. And the global situation uh, we have shown as in WHO regions, and these are colored in six different colors, as you can see, and the legend is at the bottom for your uh, perusal. Uh, but uh, just to, to take note that um, the Western Pacific region is that lower uh, purplish uh, color, uh, which, which you can see, uh, and then below that in the dark blue is Afro. And oh, globally overall, we are seeing a, a, an increase in cases and the black line on the graph represents the number of deaths, and so deaths uh, are decreasing, uh, but the number of cases increasing. You can also see on the right-hand side, the top 10 countries who have uh, the highest number of cases in the previous 24 hours. Uh, so, and this is uh, as of uh, the 1st of December. And the um, majority of those countries are from Europe, and uh, you can see that very large increase uh, in, uh, in the global situation is it being driven by the number of cases uh, occurring in Europe. Uh, and this is uh, due to a, a number of factors. And this includes the increased mobility and the lifting of public health and social measures, uh, and also uh, the uh, reduction in the use of the public health and social measures. And the next slide, please. Go back. 
and you, you so this uh, slide uh, upcoming slide will show will show the this shows the situation within the region and uh, as you can see uh, there are a, a number of our countries uh, vietnam was in the previous slide uh, showing an upward trajectory uh, and we also have um, more recently uh, we are now seeing a plateau of the overall regional picture uh, and so this means we, we do really need to be uh, watchful and mindful particularly as we have um, as we approach the uh, holiday season in many of the countries uh, within our region. The, the, now on the next slide I'll just give you some uh, highlights of, of uh, this uh, variance that we are uh, uh, seeing now, this new variant of concern. So the variant of concern was uh, initially identified uh, in South Africa and the characteristics which are really important for us to uh, have some knowledge about and to be able to take public health action uh, are uh, identified here. Now, in terms of transmissibility, uh, so, so there are three things that we need to really uh, note, transmissibility, disease severity, and impact. And in terms of transmissibility, what we see is increased transmissibility, transmissibility at this time, and this is suggested by spread in South Africa, as well as geographic spread. And all regions, all six regions of WHO have now reported uh, this uh, particular variant of concern. In terms of disease severity, we have no information at this time, which suggests uh, any change in virulence, and we should uh, continue to monitor this. With regards to impact, we know that diagno diagnostic tests that are available currently uh, are able to identify uh, this uh, particular um, variant and a uh, uh, RT-PCR tests can, can do this and the antigen tests will only identify uh, a, a COVID case and in that, after that it has to be referred for further evaluation. Uh, with regards to uh, vaccine performance, we have no information that suggests the current vaccines are not effective at this time. However, again, we need to continue to monitor as we need to do for those treatment modalities which are currently available. Uh, so overall, uh, research is underway to understand more on the transmissibility, severity and impact of this particular variant on our uh, populations. Uh, next slide, please. So in summary, um, we have um, Omicron, this new variant, designated as a variant of concern uh, based on evidence uh, emerging from South Africa. There has, um, it is associated with increased transmissibility, and we are seeing this through the increased uh, number of countries uh, reporting the variant on a daily basis and the geograph geographic, sorry, and the geographic distribution is quite likely uh, pretty, uh, pretty wide uh, already. Uh, when we look at the, some of the measures that have been taken by some of, our, um, some of the countries, uh, and so travel bans have been put in place, of course they can delay entry, but they will not prevent uh, entry of the virus. So taking all of these things into consideration at this time, uh, countries are uh, advised to prepare their response capacity using their experience from uh, responding to Delta and five key tools uh, mm -hmm. uh, can be used uh, in order to do this. And we would also recommend that the continued use of those measures which we know to be effective. And so those public health and social measures uh, such as mask wearing, social distancing, and uh, hand hygiene, and then also the use of vaccination in combination with those public health and social measures. And so therefore using vaccination and public health and social measures uh, as a way to suppress a transmission of uh, the, um, uh, suppress transmission of COVID-19. And so on that note, I will hand back to the regional director. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Babatunde. 
Unfortunately, some countries around the world are approaching the point where the number of critical cases exceed their hospital and ICU capacity. And in our region, we call this uh, the red line. Uh, once that point is reached, there are very few options other than to reintroduce very strict control measures to protect health workers and healthcare capacity and stop death going up. These uh, surges are occurring even in countries where more than 60% of people are vaccinated. Although thanks to the vaccine's effectiveness at reducing severe diseases, the number of deaths has been much smaller compared to earlier surges. Vaccine has been a game changer, definitely. But no vaccine can prevent 100% of infection and vaccinated people can still pass on the infections to others, including the vulnerable. The situations unfolding in other parts of the world at the moment shows that we cannot rely on vaccine alone. But with the vaccine in combination with other measures, we have an opportunity to shift our approach. As we have heard, Omicron has been designated the variant of concern because of the number of mutations and because early information suggests it may be more transmissible than other variants of the virus. Border controls can delay the virus coming in and by time, but every country and every com community must prepare for new surges in cases. The positive news in all this is that none of the information we have currently about Omicron suggests we need to change the directions of our response. Our experience of the last two years, especially in dealing with the variants like Delta, provides a guide about what to do now, as well as how to cope with the future surges in a more sustainable way. By calibrating response measure to each country context, using five key tools in combination, we can avoid the red line and minimize health impact as well as social and economic disruptions. So let me briefly explain. The first two, of course, is vaccine, where there is a high vaccine coverage, especially among those at the greater, greatest risk, healthcare, healthcare and the other frontline workers with frequent exposure and those most vulnerable to severe diseases, and communities that have difficulties accessing health services, we can reduce severe illness and death. The second two is the public health and social measures, which we know are effective in suppressing transmission. They remain key in the fight against COVID-19, including Omicron. This includes individual action like mask wearing and keep physical distancing, and taking a risk-based approach for particular settings and population-wide measures, including lockdown, which we wanted to avoid given their huge social and economic impact. Individual practices such as mask wearing are feasible for all of us to continue and cause little disruptions to our lives. We should all keep this up to protect ourselves, our families and our communities. Then there are risk-based approaches, which we can use to maintain important community activities. Schools are a good example. Prolonged school closure have had an enormous negative impact on children and families. The best things for our children now is to move away from zero risk approach to risk-based approach. That is regularly assessing the risk and adapting the practices that mitigate risk. By doing this, school can safely stay open. And the same method of identifying and mitigating risk can be applied to other settings, businesses, and events. <clears throat> the third area relates to how we care for people with COVID-19. Those with the asymptomatic or mild illness who are able to self-isolate and recover at home do not need to be in hospital. We need to make sure hospital and ICU beds are kept available for those with severe illness who really need them. The fourth important tool is surveillance to detect cases and potential surges early. 
This is particularly important in places which have kept the virus out and where there is limited capacity for response. Through active surveillance, we can detect chain of transmission early and then deploy targeted response. The fifth and final tool is the border control. This is another area where we should apply a risk-based approach, taking into account local capacity and context and continually calibrating measures based on assessment of evolving risk. This includes the emergence of new variants. In general, though, the higher the vaccine coverage and health system capacity, the more open borders can be. The approach I've outlined today is all about adapting so that we can learn to live with the virus over the long term, even when we have a new surges in the future. Let me be very clear. This does not mean giving up on controlling COVID-19. Instead, it means continuously calibrating combination of tools and actions based on the risk in each local settings as they evolve over time. This is what we need to be doing in response to Omicron based on what we know now and adapting our response if needed as we learn more about its transmissibility, severity, and impact. We have come a really long way. We've worked hard and made many sacrifices over the past two years, doing our best to keep ourselves and each other safe from COVID-19. This is especially the case for healthcare workers to whom we owe our deepest gratitude. Where we have high vaccine coverage, maintaining the right mix of public health and social measures and ensure hospital beds are available for those who need them, we can avoid the red line and can continue to open societies and economies. With a sustainable approach to protective measures calibrated to each context, we can avoid swinging back and forth between opening up, opening up and going back into strict lockdowns. We can adapt so that COVID-19 has less impact on our lives in 2022, and we can start, regain, and hopefully retain a sense of normality. Thank you very much.